All righty. Continuing our discussion on depression and um, last last time we kind of had a summary of what we had talked about on part one, and this will be part three. And um, so last time we dis we discussed the root of depression. Where does stress and anxiety and doubt uh, come from? And we talked about my definition of depression. And um, so knowing that we are the children of God, knowing that we have the promises of the Word of God, knowing that for us the battle is already won, and we already have the victory in Christ. Knowing that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And if he's gone to prepare a place for us. He will come to receive us. Uh, knowing all of that. Knowing also you know the principles in the scripture. Uh, such as uh, the verse that says. Um, and I'll paraphrase, everything that happens, happens for good for those that love the Lord. Right? Everything that happens in our life happens for good for those that love the Lord. And that's not the exact way the verse goes, but that's, that's the intent. And that's what uh, the verse of Scripture is trying to get across. Everything that happens in our life, whether it seems positive or negative, it is designed and taken by God. He takes it and uses it and makes something good out of it. He can take the most disastrous things in life and make great things out of them if we allow Him to. If we do not allow ourselves to get trapped in uh, stress and anxiety and doubt, which can lead to clinical de depression. And so I explained from my point of view, and I, I pray that you agree with me, that um, for the Christian, for the real Christian, for somebody who is a born-again believer, depression comes out of a perverted view of the present. a perverted view or an inaccurate view of what's going on in your life right now. We should realize as Christians that we are living in the kingdom of God right now and that we have access to all of God's power, all of God's authority, everything that Jesus, uh, everything that God has given to Jesus Christ because of his willingness to sacrifice himself on the cross for our salvation, the fact that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, everything that God has given to Jesus Christ, the Bible says we, have, we share equal inheritance. We have equal access, the same as Jesus Christ had, had access to, and could do all of the marvelous things that he did, we have the same access to the same power and the same authority. So if we sometimes think that our life is miserable, confusing, complex, if we sometimes get stressed out, anxious, begin to doubt, that's only in our head. That's only because we're not seeing things the way that God sees them. When God sees what's going on in our world, He sees us as ordained priests and kings capable of doing anything that He would like us to accomplish. But when we as human beings look at our own life, we often look at it from a perverted or an 
inaccurate point of view, and we say, oh, woe is me. And especially from a selfish point of view, when you become too self-absorbed in life, uh, then you're looking from the inside looking out, and life can seem disastrous, and you can feel useless, and you can you end up feeling like, what's the use in life? What's the purpose? What's the value? So, number one, an inaccurate view, uh, which I call a virtual reality. It, the real reality is what God sees from the outside. The inaccurate view is what we see from our inside. And that also is coupled with an in an in irrational fear of the future. You couple a perverted view of the present with an irrational fear of the future. And remember, we talked about being scared of the dark. Being scared of the dark, all children go through it, and even as adults today, most of us put us in a dark spot for more than a couple of minutes in total darkness and your mind begins to play tricks on you and you begin to freak out because you just know there's something out there that's going to get you. And it's not true, is it? The same stuff is there when the light's on or the light's off. But we, have the, we get this inaccurate view of our circumstance and this inaccurate view of what might happen once somebody turns out the light. When you're in total darkness, the world exists exactly the same as it does in the light. Things are going to happen exactly the same as long as you stay in one spot. You go try to walk around, try to walk around you're going to start bumping into things, but if you're standing in one spot, Nothing changes except the level of illumination, right? And so we must learn in order to overcome anxiety and stress and fear and doubt, uh, in order not to get drawn into depression, we have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight, just like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.7. And so today I'd like to get through um, our case study and our case study on depression. Remember I told you in the beginning that um, most of the time or many times in your Christian life, a lot of your deepest depressions will follow your greatest victories. I know it's been true in my life. And I'm sure it's probably been true in your life also. That after you have experienced a great success or a great time of joy in your life as a Christian, uh, a great time of feeling useful and having purpose and feeling valuable in the kingdom of God, um, immediately something happens that can cause you to nosedive back into the stress and anxiety and doubt. And um, one of our best examples in the Bible, and I know it's, it's really overused. Uh, there are other verses of Scripture I could use and other stories uh, in the Bible. Let's not call them stories. Let's call them history in the Bible, uh, can also teach us about depression, but it's just such a great example when we look at the case of Elijah. Elijah lived during the reign of King Ahab. King Ahab was one of the worst kings of Israel that ever existed. He was 
totally debauched. He was uh, so far uh, out of God's reality that he allowed the kingdom to be turned over to wa false worship. And so the majority of God's children at that time were worshiping a false god called Baal. And um, so when Elijah came and confronted Ahab one day, Ahab said, What now? Have you come to cause me bigger problems? And Elijah said, No, you've caused all your problems on your own. He said, I've just come in the name of the Lord. And um, so the way it happened is he told King Ahab to gather all the people of Israel to Mount Car Carmel. And when they gathered all the people at Mount Carmel, especially all the prophets of Baal, which Jezebel, Jezebel being uh, a person who had authority and power and prestige at that time in his history, she wasn't the princess or, the, or she wasn't the queen, but she had such influence over society at her time in history that um, a lot of the Baal worship that was happening in Israel was because of her. And of course, she had the king's ear and the king's heart. And um, so very, very bad situation for Ahab. Um, so anyway, um, one day, I have to set up, before we read our scripture here, I have to set up the story for you. He told Ahab to gather all the people at Mount Carmel, all the prophets of Baal, and then he spoke to the nation of Israel and he said, today I want you to decide who you are going to serve. If you are going to serve the, the false god, Baal, or if you're going to serve the true god, Jehovah. Today is the day of decision, he basically told them. So he said, I, well, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like the, all the prophets of Baal, and there was about, 400, 450, 450 of them that actually ate at Jezebel's table, which means that, you know, they got all their funding, all their assistance, all their power, all their prestige through Jezebel. Um, he said, I want all those prophets to meet with me at Mount Carmel I would like to have two bullocks, two cattle, because we're going to have a sacrifice. And um, I'd like those two sacrifices, those two bullocks, prepared, butchered, and put on the altar, and then you call to your god Baal, and then I'll call to my God, Jehovah, and we'll see what happens. So they built two altars and butchered the bullocks and put the wood on the, uh, on the altar in order for the burnt sacrifice to their God. And uh, they put the bullock parts on the, on the wood and they began to pray, the false prophets began to pray to Baal 
and they began to pray. And as Baal ignored them or didn't hear them or didn't respond, they began to pray harder. And as that didn't work, they began to work themselves up into a frenzy. And um, during the, all this time, throughout the day, this happened from morning until, you know, after lunchtime. And during the whole time, Elijah's over here and he's making fun of them. He's saying, maybe you guys need to, to pray a little louder. Maybe your God is asleep and needs to be awoken. Uh, maybe he's on a journey and you'll have to wait until he gets back. Uh, perhaps your God is too busy and you just need, you guys need to get his attention somehow. He just, he kept making little remarks and quirks that today we find kind of amusing because it would be, um, you know, the same kind of thing when when we make fun of people that we know are doing nonsense. He knew that what they were doing was utter nonsense and that they would get no response because there is no God named Baal. And yet they tried so hard and worked themselves up into a frenzy. And the Bible says they started cutting themselves and bleeding as was their manner of, of doing, their way of worshiping. Um, so this, you know, this kind of uh, self-abuse in order to feel more self-righteous, it, it's not something new. Uh, it's been happening for thousands of years. Um, and they just worked themselves up into this frenzy, dancing around, jumping all around on the altars, doing everything they could to try to get their God's attention. Well, by the time of the evening sacrifice the normal time for sacrifice, nothing had happened. So Elijah, at that point, um, he said, well, I think you guys have basically had enough time, so let's give Jehovah a chance. And so he rebuilt the altar that had been knocked down by all the frenzy, put out, Twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. Put the wood down. Put the bullock parts on the wood. And then he told the guys there that were helping him, and said, I want you to pour water on the altar. They dug a trench, even dug a trench around the altar so that the trench would hold water and they poured jars, big jars of water on the altar. Four big jars of water on the altar. After they had done that, Elijah said, do it again. They poured water on it a second time. Elijah said, do it again. They poured water on it the third time. So by this time, everything's soaked. The wood is soaked. There's a, a, a trough of water around the altar. And um, at that point, you know, everybody's just amazed at what he's doing. And then Elijah said a simple prayer a simple prayer he just talked to God and he said God basically show these people that you are the true God 
so that they might know who they should worship. Um, that's not exactly what he said, but that's the basis of it, the basics. Immediately, fire came down out of the sky, consumed the bullock, the wood, the stones, the water. There was nothing left. Immediately, fire came down out of heaven and totally consumed everything that was there. And it was at that point that the people finally realized that Jehovah was the true God. And so Elijah, on that great victory, you know, on, on standing on top of that great victory and that huge success for God, he um, tells the people, you know, after the people decide, hey, we're going to worship Jehovah from now on. We're not going to worship Baal because he doesn't really exist. So Elijah told them, we need to get rid of all of these false prophets. So all the false prophets were killed with the sword. Uh, not just the 400, not just the 450, but everybody that was part of the worship process for Baal was immediately killed that day. And, um, of course, that was, that was not a murderous thing. That was to purify the nation in order so that they could start over again in their worship of the true God. But here's what happened. Now we go, go to our screen here and we begin to read what happened next. Okay, so in the 19th, all of that happened in the 8th, 18th chapter of First Kings, and you can go and read that for yourselves. Uh, in the 19th chapter, here we go in verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now look at that. After God had done such a, a spectacular miracle, after, you know, basically we could say a great military defeat at the hand of Elijah, Jezebel simply sends a message that says, hey, uh, I'm going to make sure you're dead by this time tomorrow. And immediately Elijah gets so confused and upset and he begins to doubt. And what does he do? He turned tail and runs. He runs off into the wilderness, even leaving his apprentice behind. Okay, now verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. What do people do when they're depressed? They sleep a lot, don't they? And the angel of the Lord came back 
verse 7, angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. And you have to understand, this is not a journey that uh, right now, it's not a journey that God is sending him on. It's a journey that Elijah has chosen for himself. He's trying to run away from his problems. Okay, now verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and now they seek to take my life. Look at his perspective. Look at how he's thinking. He's thinking from the inside out instead of seeing his victory from the outside in, right? The Lord comes to him and says, Elijah, what in the world are you doing out here? Forty days out in the wilderness. What are you doing here? Elijah comes back and says, Lord, I've tried. I've been very zealous. I've done everything for you. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They're worshiping a false god. They killed all your prophets with a sword, and now they're after me. He said, I'm the only one, uh, one of your people left, and now they seek to take my life. Now, verse 11. Then he said, God said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still, small voice. What do you think God was doing here? God wanted to make sure that he had Elijah's total attention. Right? He wanted to make sure there was no, there would be uh, no way that Elijah could be um, mistaken that God was here and that God was doing things and that God was at work. So there came a wind, there came an earthquake, uh, and um, in all of that, it says that was the Lord passing by and it must have been passing by at a distance because the Lord wasn't in any of those things. But then comes finally what most of us finally hear. You know, our lives can be falling apart, and the more our lives seem to be falling apart, even if the Lord is right there with us, even with Jesus Christ in our heart, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within our spirit. Oftentimes, God can do things to get our full attention, and yet we still remain perplexed and stressed and fearful and doubtful, 
until finally we hear that still small voice. Verse 13. So it is, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, again, the second time, What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 14. And Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down the altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also ye shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nishi, Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. So here God is, first of all, giving um, Elijah uh, some words of comfort, basically saying, um, you need to get back to work here. You need to get back to business. Your life is not over yet. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and set up the things that it's going to take in order for the kingdom of God to advance and for the people to come back and worship God instead of worshiping false gods. So he told him, go and return to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria and, and the other things he was told to do. And now verse 18, Yet have I reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. These are the greatest words of comfort that he could have given to Elijah at this point in Elijah's ordeal. Elijah, in his selfish view of what was going on in the world, he was thinking, I'm the only prophet left. And if they kill me, what's going to happen? Well, God tells him, first of all, I want you to obey and I want you to believe. And then he gives him these words of comfort in verse 18. He says, Yet have I reserved 7,000 people in Israel, all whose knees have never bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, he was telling Elijah, you're not alone. You're not alone. You think you're alone in this thing, in this battle? You're not alone. There's a lot of people out there that I'm going to bring to aid you in returning the people back to worship. Sometimes, you know, we need words of comfort. Sometimes we need those positive and reinforcing words that come from others and that come from God. 
But you know what? The main thing is that we need to know is that we're not alone. No matter what we're suffering through, no matter what we're going through in life that has led us to a point of depression, we're not alone. If you think that, hey, I've been very zealous for the Lord and I've been trying all I can, but we look at the pews this morning and we see how many are empty and how many people just decided not to come to church today. And we could think, well, what's the use to keep ministering to these kind of people who who are not even dedicated anymore, who can't even manage to come to worship God for one hour out of the week. And we can kind of get that same perception that Elijah had, that, hey, if it's just me all on my own trying to do this, what's the use? The world's going to drag me down and trample me underfoot. And if that's what's going to happen, I think I would rather stay out of it. I think I would rather run away from it. That was exactly what was going on in Elijah's head and in Elijah's heart. He thought, I'm alone in this now, and I just can't deal with it anymore, so I'm out of here. Now remember what I told you. The key to overcoming depression is faith. Right? What does faith involve? Faith involves believing what God says, but not just believing it, Believing it so much that you're willing to obey what he tells you to do. So it is belief and obedience combined. And we learn later on as you look into the life of Elijah that his victories weren't over. His life wasn't over. Jezebel wasn't going to kill him. The Lord had reserved 7,000 people there that would have his back and help him restore the nation of Israel spiritually. And you know what? God's got our back. No matter what we're going through, God has our back. What does it require for us to come out of the pits of depression and to get over our stress and our worries and, and to be able to deal with people that are causing us troubles and heartaches and sorrows? Quite simply, to start hearing that still small voice of God that says, here's what I want you to do. Now go and do it. And do it without any doubts in your mind. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Speaking of depression, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the causes of depression and, and so on. One in ten people that go to visit a doctor, it's estimated one in ten people have depression. Whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, one in ten people is the estimate. But I believe right now it's more than that. I would say that many more people that go to the doctor are suffering from depression rather than just a physical illness. Because we all know that stress can have a horrible effect on the human body. 
and um, stress is part of depression. Stress, doubt, worry. The next point I'll make here is that depression is more than just the normal feelings of sadness associated with life events. You know, if you lose a loved one, if um, somebody breaks into your car, if your dog runs away, you know, those are all sad things. But depression is more than just the normal feeling of sadness that you would typically get over in a short time. Depression is that which you allow to linger in your mind and in your heart to the point that you cannot function normally anymore. Okay, the next point. It may be mild, moderate, or severe, but it's all depression. And here's an important point. It is not something that people just snap out of. It's a process. Elijah had this great success in the Lord. The next day, he was cowering out in the wilderness, afraid of what was going to happen next. He was in the very pits of depression, thinking that his life was over. He wanted to die. That's, you know, when the Lord talked to him first, Elijah, the first, when the Lord first spoke to him, Elijah, what are you doing out here? Elijah basically said, take my life right now because I just can't deal with what's going on. I just can't deal with it anymore. Has anybody ever been to that point in your life? I just can't take one more thing. If one more thing happens, that's it. So he was at that point, actually, we could say suicidal. He made no attempt on his life, but he said, Lord, take my life right now because I just don't want to deal with it anymore. Well, you know what? There's going to come periods in our lives no matter who we are, no matter how great your life is, or no matter how miserable your life can get, there are going to be periods where you're going to suffer from depression. The stress is going to seem overwhelming. The fears, even though they're unfounded, are going to scare you and frighten you out of your wits. Your position and your outlook on the future is just going to, to die. And you're going to think, what's the use in even going on? But that's when, once you reach that point where you can listen, God can start the process that will bring you out of your depression. And the only thing that's going to work is if you're willing to listen to the voice, listen to what God tells you to do next, and then do it. Do it. Do it despite the fact that you don't want to do it. Do it despite the fact that you don't think it's going to work. Do it despite the fact that you don't see any future in it. Do it because God says to do it. And when that happens, he definitely will give you um, the steps you need to take next and the things you need to do. In fact, they're already given to us in his word. During a time of depression, that's when we need to go and dig into God's word 
and really listen to what the Spirit has to say to us. The still small voice is going to lead us into out of depression. Doesn't happen overnight, but it's a process. As we obey God and begin to do the things that He wants us to do, our faith begins to build once again. And as we engage that faith, the power to overcome becomes ours. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because that's the promise of God's Word. And we're out of time, so we'll stop there uh, for this week, and we'll continue again uh, next week. All right.